let me talk a little bit about the fur trade. You know, what was going on uh, when Angus came over. I don't think this PA system works. It's an on. It doesn't help. Yeah. 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 The fur trade that was going on at that time, the, the, uh, there was a great market in Europe for furs. And uh, all kinds of furs, whether it's beaver or a fox or ermine or whatever it might be. And then especially then later for buffalo, for the, the hides from the buffalo. The, because it made very good leather. Leather for belts, leather for shoes, and, uh, and leather also for machinery, for the big belts for machinery. So there's a big market for that. And there was a big supply, you know, millions of buffalo. And uh, <clears throat> also furs, the beaver and the and, uh, fox and all the muskrats, all the different animals and furs that they used. Uh, there was a plentiful supply for that too. And so the uh, fur traders came and uh, in the Northwest, the Hudson's Bay Company came, of course, into Canada and then down into the Northwest. And they claimed all the territory north of the Columbia River and north of the Snake River. And if you're acquainted with geography, the Snake River starts in Yellowstone Park, and <coughs> goes uh, across uh, uh, Idaho and into Oregon, and then meets the Columbia out at, the, at what we call the uh, Tri Cities, Pasco, Washington. <coughs> So anyway, the, the Columbia starts up in Canada and comes down and just gets a corner of Montana and then goes into Washington and then on down through Washington. And it all goes out the mouth of the Columbia, divides Oregon and Washington. <coughs> so that was, that was the territory. The first, the English would bring these big schooner ships up the river. They actually could come up the river with those sailing ships. And they have a time where they even now have big motorized ships. It only takes a, that takes a special captain to go out and bring those ships in. Like the Japanese or Koreans will come in with a big ship. And then when they get off the coast of Oregon, they have to have this captain come out, a pilot, a professional pilot, to pilot the ship in because the river changes, the bottom changes. And I guess where the water goes out, such a huge body of water, and meets the ocean, there's some really swells and currents. But it's pretty hard to imagine how they could get those little sailing vessels up there. All those sails, but, but they did. And they came up to what is now Portland, where Fort Vancouver was. And they came up that far. And so they had to get the first to Fort Vancouver. And at first they were floating them down the river. And these boats had these big wooden boats. And there's some per perilous stories of these guys, because there's real, some real white water. These big unmanageable boats with oarsmen and going down there with these furs is really something. And Angus made a few of those trips and tells about it and writes a poem about it in the Angus McDonald book. Because they lost a lot of lives with that, with people falling out of the boat or both capsizing. Well then later, when Port Colville was established, then they started taking the furs out on horses, packing them on horses. And uh, so <clears throat> they put 90 pounds packs on uh, on each side of the horse, so the horse would carry 180 pounds. And they used the uh, buffalo hides, the Salish people, the Pondre people, we, uh, we confuse them, we interact with Salish and Pondre. Uh, the, the Salish, all the Indians in western, Wash, eastern Washington, northern Idaho, Montana are all Salish speaking. So we call up the Kalispells, the Spokans, the Coeur d'Alene's, the Bitterroot Salish, the Ponderay, we generalize them, names Salish, but it was the Ponderays and Salish, Bitterroot Salish, that Angus is, you know, so fond of and so close friends of them. You know. <clears throat> but uh, they would take these uh, buffalo hides and the Ponderays could make saddle blankets out of them. They, they'd take the meat off them and soften the hides and the fur down, they made saddle blankets, they made cinches, and then they could put the pack saddles on top of the saddle blanket, and then tie these these uh, 90 pound packs on each side of the on each side of the horse. They'd have a, sometimes if they had a big shipment, like in 1852, they they had over 5,000 buffalo hides shipped out of Little Fort Conda down there, close to. And so to do that, they would have you know a couple hundred hundred head of horses, all packed. Well, you couldn't string them out like you see in the like we do with the pack string because 
couple hundred would stretch from here to Columbia Falls. <laughs> so they, they put them on, they herded them. They called it a brigade. Brigade of horses will follow one another, and they probably pack a couple of them, a saddle horse, and two, two or three guys with saddle horses and pack horses out in front, and then horse guys behind, you know, bringing them up and keeping them together. And they would travel that way in a, in a, in a brigade. And uh, so they went on out to the west coast, the port of Squally, and then later, after the big fight over the line, they started going into British Columbia, to the port south of British Columbia, uh, to, to ship these hides. So that, that was the industry. <clears throat> when Angus uh, first came over, he was sent to Fort Hall. And uh, at Fort Hall, he, uh, the trade was not so good. It was a great place for the people going to Oregon on the Oregon Trail. So they had a great retail business there. But they didn't have very many hides to buy. And so he, they went to a uh, rendezvous. They went to a rendezvous north of there. And it was at this rendezvous where they were buying hides that Angus spent his wife to be a uh, captain. And, uh, so he did so well there at Fort Hall, and uh, the English, in his contract, he signed the contract that he'd be loyal, he'd defend, he'd do all these things. And he did that. He did that very, very well. He defended the English right, the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, he <coughs> did the trade so well. He learned the language. He's very interested in that. He's a very learned man. Because when he, when he came to the, to the U.S. or to this continent, he could speak uh, Gaelic, of course, he's raised on that, speak English, and he could speak French. So he had those three languages when he came. <clears throat> and he picked up, when he was at, when he first got to Fort Colville, his uh, uncle, Ray, didn't uh, treat him very well. Kind of, was kind of haughty to him. And they give him menial tasks there. And uh, so he amused himself by studying the language of the people there and the culture there and became very, First in it, sign language and the Salish language, <coughs> Shahatan language, which is another language out there. So he became first in that. And so anyway, they were so pleased with his work at, at, at Fort Hall that they sent him up to, to Postscript to de develop that post. There was a Hudson Bay fur trader, Neil MacArthur, that was there first, and they had a post on down the river, more towards Idaho. And it was, it was kind of off the beaten path, they were getting ready to close it. So they asked Neil to come up and scout out a place for, for a port uh, up in this area. So he did, the year before Angus got there. I don't think he started any construction because in the literature that we find, uh, Angus uh, did not, uh, excuse me, he started to, from scratch with the port because he was going to build it over farther to the, towards the mountains on the bank of the creek. And, uh, so <clears throat> the bank of the creek and the, the Salish uh, chief uh, slips to, he became friends. And, right up here, why don't we get you? He were right up here. And slips to, uh, told him don't build it there because the black people, the black people were a warring tribe and they would come and they would hide in the bushes in the brush and the heavy timber and they'd kill everybody. So Angus moved it out in the middle. So we think he did, his, he and his crew did the original construction. The site was, the area was surveyed out by, uh, by uh, uh, Neil McCarthy. So that's where it started. And the trade was really something. I'm just talking about the fur trade. Believe it or not. Captain and Angus, the new one. So, so the fur trade, when Angus got there, he wanted to you know, go out and go hunting with the, the hunting parties that go over the mountains or you went yesterday over the other side out in the Great Plains and they hunt the buffalo out there. He wanted to go on that party with him. But as he, as he moved over, he had 27 or 28 head of horses. And, uh, and they no more got here and the Blackfeet came and stole all the horses. So he couldn't go on the first hunting trip. But from then on he did. He went on, went on those buffalo hunts with them and he went on war parties with them. And uh, so the trade really flourished because the Indians really didn't like him. Talk about <clears throat> the, the fur trade really did flourish you know, under his direction. So I'll stop there. And uh, Wyman, you're on. Thank you. <laughs>
I, I guess I'm telling you very quickly here, I'm very deaf, deep, hearing impaired. And uh, anyway, uh, there is, a, I used to say that it was a, uh, uh, I had trouble with, with uh, leaving uh, I used to say that was because of uh, my second language, since I don't have a second language. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, there was a girl, a lady, I was in a meeting, a Seattle Indian meeting about 40, 50 years ago or so, and uh, I was, after the meeting, I was sitting with some people, from, native people from Alaska, and some of you have heard this yesterday. This story's been around for quite a while. Joe has probably heard it. And anyway, they, they kept asking my name. You know, how does a half-breed half blood Indian uh, get a name like Lyman Julian? And um, I'm pretty sure most of you have not heard that kind of a name either. But uh, and sitting there, this, this uh, one lady says, oh, it's easy. They were calling me everything, Wayland, Harmon, uh, Lyman. In fact, my father-in-law, uh, for 30 years after we were married, still called me Lyman. <laughs> <laughs> so this one lady finally says, she was pretty quiet. I asked her, uh, she says, oh, I, I get it very quickly. She says, because English is my second language, she says, I word associate. So, party broke up and was getting ready to leave and I, I asked her, I said, I'm going to test your association. So I said, what's my name? She said, your name is Hyman Hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> it was so hilarious, I was stunned. For <laughs> she associated me with McDonald's hamburgers. <laughs> I have some handouts here, but first, before I do that, I would like to recognize my cousin brother, um, Eric Wilson, uh, and his lovely wife, still from the Washington, D.C. area, I believe. Yes. Eric is a uh, Angus MacDonald great-great-grandson. I Just a few words about Eric is that his uh, uh, great-grandmother, Annie Wilson, was Annie McDonald Wilson, was the older sister of my grandfather, Joe McDonald. She was born in 1853. My grandfather was born in 1866. Um, she married a Nesperance warrior by the name of Asa Wilson, and his Indian name was Thunderheart, I believe. Is that right, Dick? I believe that's right. Uh, right. It's a pretty prestigious line. Uh, anyway, I, I want to do my cousin brother. <laughs> uh, I have some handouts here, and I'm just going to speak for a few minutes. But I'll pass these around. There's about two dozen here. If you have it already, then that'll be fine. If you don't, then keep a copy, and what I'm going to do is keep a copy here. And I'm going to speak just for a few minutes in reference to an article that came out a year ago in the Signal newspaper. And this was, uh, Mary asked me to do this uh, since she was planning the, the meeting here uh, a year ago, started planning, I believe. And uh, I'll keep one copy and pass this around. Northwest. I have included in this letter two published accounts of the respect 
uh, Steve Angus was held in by both Indian Native Americans and non-Indian communities in the Pacific Northwest. The first reports in 1870 from the Missoulian and Cedar Creek newspaper states as follows. This is the rem reminiscence of the late Flathead Chief Victor. McDonald was a recipient of a present re recently which was made under peculiar circumstances. By his noble manliness and gentlemanly qualities, Mr. McDonald has made himself the friend not only of all the white settlers, but also among the Indians far and wide. He has none but devoted and admirers. This was especially shown in a short time since when Victor the able and honorable chief of the while on his annual buffalo hunt in the enemy's country, finding himself to be near the end of life, requested those who surrounded his deathbed to give his old warrior host horse to Mr. McDonald as a present from a dying friend. The uh, second article, uh, if you have the article, it's going to be on the towards the last page of your, uh, some uh, historical research I found. They're talking about uh, the fur traders in the Northwest in the first paragraph of the second, well, page one. Uh, and then it talks about uh, the uh, The, um, I'll go into this paragraph first. After Archie McDonald left, or, after Archibald McDonald left in 1844, the successive management of several other others until it devolved on Angus McDonald in 1852. Angus, a romantic and eccentric, <laughs> Angus valued the native traditions, was sometimes hostile to missionaries and low, low civilization. <laughs> and Americans. <laughs> According to a trade competitor, Angus was revered by the Indians. When an Indian, either a Spokane or Kalispell, died, it was discovered that, discovered that he had requested that Angus have first choice of his horses, his widow second. <laughs> <laughs> Not a single one of the 13 non managers of the Colville district was married to a European woman. At least Archibald and Angus were formerly married to their Indian wives, and several other managers remained with the common law wives for the rest of their lives. Just a, a brief <coughs> editorial about uh, Angus, uh, his feelings uh, towards the missionary civilization and, and Americans. The reason it happened was is that he was, uh, this when he first came, from Scotland in 1838. He was uh, very enthusiastic, very, he was living history and he knew it and he loved it. Um, it is really unknown why, exactly why he left Scotland except that it was a better life. And of course after the wars, I think it was the last, in 1746, the Culloden War, um, there was the Highland Scottish people who were defeated by the King of England. But uh, as time passed, and particularly the treatment by the United States government and missionaries and civilization of the native people that he was closest to, and that was the Nez Perce people because his wife was Nez Perce, and also because he lived among the Flatheads. So um, their treatment in the war of 1877, the Nest First War, and the removal of the Flatheads from the Bitterroot that took place from 1855 until 1890, or 91, I'm not sure which. But they were, they were, he was very embittered about that treatment.
201. Excuse me for a minute. Maybe Joel can help me out for a minute. But I get very emotional, especially when I'm not feeling very good. Some people have heard them already. And I'm kind of under the web. Um, so anyway, I wanted to let you know about the the feeling, though, what went what went through the Indian people in that very difficult period of time. This is what I guess you would call historical grief. And that's what Angus went through, particularly also. Since his people from Scotland were massacred in 1492 or 91, I'm not sure which now, by King William II or III, where King William ordered put all to the sword. Between seven and seventy. And Angus's great grandfather was a great great grandfather who was a twelve year old boy and managed to escape into the hills. It was a bitter cold winter. John Preble has the definitive book on the, on Glencoe. Um, there are some horrible stories in there. I'll just try to briefly tell you about one, and that was a small boy. Um, oh, first of all, the old chief, Alexander Ian MacDonald, was supposed to pledge fealty to the king. He went, tried to, but wasn't able to. Wasn't able to get to the right spot because of our foot and walking in the middle of the winter. Um, that was the reason the king ordered the, the killing of the all of the McDonald's. Um, one of the stories is, is about the old chief. He and his wife, uh, I think, um, two children, their wives, two, uh, and, and there were seven all together. They laid them on the floor before they actually started killing. They cut, oh, they cut their throats.
become soldiers, got to like him, and they, they were getting along good. And uh, he, uh, after he told him that, then that grown up kid, so he's talking to him and he held up his hand like that. Well, anyway, I'll let Joe get back to I hope that he can do this better. I'm sure he can. And um, elders always do this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bill. Well, I mean, let me say something before you sit down. I was totally moved by your passion. Yeah, uh, Thelma, <laughs> you need to translate for me. Um, I was totally moved by your passion for your people, both Native and McDonald. Your emotion has moved me because I have the same passion both for the Natives and for the McDonald's. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. I would just like to add on that, if I could, for a minute. I would like to express my appreciation for a wonderful event that Mary McDonald, Bill McDaniels, um, Trish and her bill, and um, let's see, and uh, the president, I, um, Diane, and whoever else has been on the planning committee, you have done an amazing job. Terribly interesting, very interesting, very eventful, very a very good job. I can't imagine. Uh, having done it any better, except that I wish I could communicate better. <laughs> Thank you. I did find my son. Young fellow. <laughs> I got him by about four years. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very moving. Uh, and Angus was very, very moving. He had a good friend, uh, Hiram Knowles, who was a senator from our district. I'm not sure who, you know, what territory at that time, but he'd write to Hiram Knowles. <clears throat> he told about the, uh, that was a big goal, and how the sisters, sisters of charity, or sisters of Providence, I don't know which one, they went down there, and there were nurses, and they gave first aid to just the settlers and the soldiers, and they let the Indians, you know, lie and give them first aid. So in closing the letter, he says, I'll oh, oh, condemn Christianity. <laughs> but he didn't stay that way. He was married by uh, the post factor at Fort Hall uh, when he married uh, Catherine. And then Catherine, when they got out into Washington, Catherine got very much in the Catholic Church. And she talked Angus into having the marriage done in the Catholic Church. So about 1854, he was remarried, remarried in the church. <clears throat> so he did have some, uh, some not necessarily passion for the church, but he did agree to do that. And I think he got along with the mission, uh, the St. Ignatius mission, because it was established in 1892. Well, it was after she died, maybe, though. But it was going in, in Stevensville, South of Missoula, where the, where the uh, Salish, the bitter and Salish were. Uh, they started their first mission there in 1842, I think, or 46. This is a big anniversary this year of the church in Western Montana. So I guess it's 1841, 175th anniversary. And uh, so he was acquainted with the church some there too. And I asked my one aunt, I said, why, did, why was he so down on the church? I had read this letter about the, the bitter and hadn't, had, didn't know about Glen Co at the time. Uh, but she said, well, she thought it was because of the, uh, you know, he, was, he wanted the people to hunt and trap and the missionaries came and they wanted them to farm and raise gardens and don't be not so dependent on the, on the hunting because the hunting was, you know, the time was running out on hunting. And so he thought maybe that carried some of that to uh, his dislike for the church. So he just, just wasn't really a church, a church man. I'm not sure uh, what kind of funeral he had, if the captain had a Catholic funeral or not. <laughs> <laughs> we did have our own cemetery. Because St. Ignatius wasn't established then, and so 
uh, this chief that I was telling you about that salutes to, he said, Angus, this is 1847, don't build that, don't build that, that post next to the creek because the black people hide in the trees and they don't shoot everybody. So he moved it out where it is now, out in the open. And two years later, Slits II died, an a, a, a epidemic hit the, the Ponderays. And Slits II was dying, and he asked uh, Angus, he said, if he could be buried, if you bury me, you know, there's a little uh, group of trees, pine trees, about halfway between the post and the creek. Could you bury me there? So, uh, so Angus did do that. And so then, you know, 40 years later, when Angus was dying, and uh, he asked Duncan, he was dying, his home was right there at the trading post, they built a two-story plot of home. He asked Duncan if he couldn't be buried next to that old uh, pond ridge. And so Duncan did that. And so <clears throat> Angus was buried there. So that became the McDonald Cemetery. And uh, later, uh, Angus's wife, Catherine, was buried there. Annie that Wyman talked about, and your great grandma, she's buried there. Uh, Alexander, his son, is, uh, is buried there. He has a son-in-law that's buried there. Of course, then, uh, then his uh, some grandchildren that are buried there. So, so it became the, the McDonald Cemetery. But he was he was very very loyal to the English. That probably probably his hostility towards civilization came from that. What the what the American settlers were doing and taking over that territory. He's very loyal to the English, and so that's probably another reason why he you know disliked what was going on so so badly. He was a great entertainer. Uh, he'd have loved that event last night. He'd have been dancing and singing, <laughs> telling stories. It would have been a little dry for him last night. <laughs> a little dry for a lot of us. <laughs> a little bit about that. Our college campus, uh, uh, the board was pretty vehement about uh, being a non-alcoholic campus. <laughs> and I know we could have talked him into wine last night, but it's like pulling your thumb out of the dike. <laughs> some of us have won it, they'd say, well, you got it for that, and, and so forth. We have some weddings, <clears throat> so, so it's just that way. Uh, but Angus, Angus did like his, like his rum or whatever they drank in those days. He liked to entertain. When he was out at Fort Colville, after he left, uh, he was only at, at uh, uh, Fort Connor for five years. And Duncan was born there, and his son Donald was born there. And then the whole family moved out to Fort Colville, and he was put in charge of all the, the posts in that Columbia, uh, Eastern Columbia district. He was put in charge, in charge of all that. And it was a nice big house, you know, by standards of those days. Now you wouldn't think such when you see the pictures of it. But in those days, it was a nice big house. And they did a lot of entertaining there. But dignitaries would come through and read about them. And a lot of entertaining, he would entertain with his stories. And what was it? Sword dance was it that Alex that they talked about? <coughs> he did the sword dance. I don't know if it's Alex. Uh, what, take a minute, let me do Alex uh, Christie here. Came all the way from England, and she is the great granddaughter of uh, Angus's brother. Duncan. Great, great, great. Great, great. great. <laughs> <laughs> She's done the sword dance. <laughs> so he did a lot of entertaining, and his oldest daughter was Christine, and. Uh, Christine kind of took over the role for the household role for Catherine. Catherine wasn't into that. Catherine was the old Indian way of raising kids and didn't care for the house and <clears throat> liked to move around and live in the teepee and travel. And so Christine did a lot of the hosting, even as a you know little young teenage girl, the hosting of the people there. <clears throat> so he was really devoted to Christine. His, his first son was John and about the time they were at Fort Caldwell, John died of some kind of fever. Uh, Alex tells me it was a cut on his hand that he got, he got blood poison in and, and died. <clears throat> but he, he was at Fort Caldwell for a long time and, uh, and uh, charged of all the posts. So he traveled around, kept his acquaintance with the uh, Ponderays, with the Bitterroot Salish, Kalispells, the Coeur d'Alene. It's all Salish and language is all pretty common. He spoke the language, so he was able to really get along and, and be very well liked, very, very well liked. As I told you last night, uh, Catherine was a very strong person and delivered all of her own children. Uh, the only one that she only had assistance on one. And you can imagine this, she was nine months pregnant and on a buffalo hunt on a horse, which would be for us now be a four or five day ride. 
to get over to in the Great Falls area. And uh, the, way, the baby was born over there on the, on the Sun River. So she was really one very strong, very, very, very strong lady. Uh, Angus, which is the defense of, the, uh, of England, he got into a lot of, you know, really, I think he was young at Fort Hall. I didn't read a fist of Gus, but I think he's plenty capable if that hadn't happened because he was, he was very loyal to the English and very loyal to the, to the Hudson's Bay Company as he did that. Uh, as far as the building itself, Fort County, you were there yesterday, and it's an amazing building that it stayed all that long. Uh, when, the, when the reservation was open to a settlement in 1910, it was set aside in 1855. The Indians, the last Indians were literally moved in like 1891. <clears throat> and then right on the heels of that, the government uh, opened the area to homesteaders. And so prior to homesteading, they gave each Indian was alive with a tract of land, 80 acres of this farm land, 160 acres of it was grazing land. And so everybody got a lot. And so all of our family, my, my granddad is Joe McDonald, and so all of his family got allotments around the post. And uh, <clears throat> so the, the allotment that the post sits on was my Uncle Benny's allotment. And it's so sit in there that the roads, township, the roads are a ways, and there's no road into that place. There's no road into it. And uh, Uncle Benny sold it, so it was in different ranchers' hands and different people lived in that trading post. And even when I was a kid, they were living in the trading post. They, people lived in it up into the 50s. <clears throat> and uh, so it's amazing that it stood. And I always, we always gave up of any kind of the Dickens because he was, you know, he was a bachelor uncle. He was a real alcoholic. He do that braiding and very good artistic. And then he would sell it all and then he'd go out and run. And he'd come back and he wouldn't have anything. He'd even sell pockets, coat, shoes. And, you know, but if it wasn't for Uncle Benny, we wouldn't have that training post, I think, because there had been some others allotment. You know, the family would have lived in it, and it probably would have burned down, you know, by falling apart. But in fact, it was isolated out there, and we didn't have access to it. Uh, it preserved it. And so the Port County Restoration Society, about 1970, uh, started meeting under a direction of my Uncle Walter. They're just determined to uh, restore that. And so they formed the Port Cotta Restoration Society and they raised money and, and uh, they, they were able to disassemble the building and put new logs underneath it, put a roof on it, save its life that way. <clears throat> they later got a land grant from the people that owned it and they deeded the four acres around the post to the Port Cotta Restoration Society. And so that really served and they also deeded the land around the cemetery Fort Connor Restoration Society. So we McDonald's don't own it. The Fort Connor Restoration Society owns it. And, uh, and you could own it. I think some of you probably joined last night. It's $25. And so then you become part owners in this Fort, in the Fort Connor also. The land adjacent to it was a uh, allotment of a, of a brother of Benny's. And uh, he was alive, just a younger. So they gave everybody who was on the list, on the rolls, we call it, a allotment. So this young brother Daniel got this allotment and then he died when he was about seven or eight years old. And he's, he's buried at the cemetery too. So that allotment <coughs> kind of stayed in the family. And, uh, it's a, uh, the way the records are kept, everybody in the family, all of his family, brothers and sisters own part of that the allotment. The allotment back there adjacent to the cemetery was my dad's allotment, ethnic allotment. So Ed McDonald's allotment and Daniel McDonald's allotment kind of made the little postscript farm where I was raised and where my grandfather lived and where many of the McDonald's, you know, lived from time to time there. And so the Port County Restoration Society was able to raise money to buy 15 acres of adjacent to the highway and adjacent to this Daniel McDonald allotment. So it's adjacent there. And they raised 50 some thousand dollars and bought that. So they have access off the highway into the uh, into that area, and then uh, then our family that owns that uh, adjacent piece, the Daniel McDonald lot, and so we give them a right away through that. And uh, 
so, so there's a right away, so we do have access to it. And, uh, so it makes it much better. And we're also given a right away through the cemetery. Those of you that were able to go to the cemetery, walk right along the fence, go all the way. So we have an easement uh, there too. And our goal is to have that trail fixed enough so that somebody in a wheelchair can roll down there, or a powered wheelchair, they can go down there, they can get to the cemetery. Uh, Alex and uh, her research at the University of Montana found the map of the people that are buried there, and the stones and the dates and all that. Now, that was very informative. And I think looking at the map, we have a stone for just about every grave, except for, for, for a couple. A couple of them are there that are unmarked graves. So, so, so they're all there. So that's the work of the Fort Connor Restoration Society. A little bit about the explanation about the uh, chimney that you all chipped in. And, Gave six thousand dollars to her. I said, "Geez, we don't have anything to show. Look like we built them out of that six thousand dollars." We really do have a lot to show. Uh, we do have the base holes cut in the floor, and the base is poured. Uh, that's all done, ready for the bricks. Uh, the blocks are being made up uh, above that first building where they're at. And you have about two thirds of the blocks, and so it's, those are finished. And the pattern is stacking them up. There. And the next time you come through and you want to visit why Bill, there'll be a there'll be a fireplace there. Wyman? I'd like to say a few words before we finish. Okay. Wyman's Wyman. He's warming up here. Go ahead, Wyman. There is a a story of uh, I think that uh, Sherry, Joe's wife, has told me several times, usually at funerals. <laughs> you, ought to, you ought to say something about how you got your name. But anyway, on uh, December 31st, 1937, Joe's mother got my mother to the hospital. I was born about three or four hours late. And I was the 13th child in a family of 13 and uh, weighed o over 13 pounds. <laughs> 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 My mother, uh, Isabel, Joe's mother, came in and asked her, uh, asked my mother, she says, well, what do you want to call him? She says, I don't think I can do it, Isabel, I don't think I'm going to make it. After um, overaged and overweight child, she thought she was, was going to die. So uh, Isabel had a favorite brother by the name of Wyman, and the only other guy I guess I've ever heard with that name, except one other one, but then the, the, the nun, or the sister of charity in the mission, was a sister by the name of Julian, uh, Sister Julian. So that's how I got the wine of Julian. And <laughs> my dad was drunk, the doctor was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, so anyway, I promised Sherry I'd say this something because it is, and I've never, I, like I said, I, I still get called by my nicknames. And one of the ones that was given to me as a small child, still people still call me that, my high school days, things like that, uh, Pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, and Isabel, ended up calling her own boys Dick and Joe. <laughs> yeah, my mother must have been one to follow the McDonald history. Because uh, she was a white of Chippewa, so she wasn't from here. And uh, so we got to name Dick and Joe. We were named after Joe after my grandfather. And Franklin after my other grandfather, so Joseph and Franklin. The, uh, Angus, you know, when he was at the trading post, that was unique in the trade that went on. The uh, the, uh, the Indians would come, and not, not only would they buy the hides, but they also brought the dried buffalo meat. And the, the Fort Fort Connor became the supply depot, so to speak, for all of the personnel that worked for the Hudson's Bay Company because they needed food. Packers needed food, people, workers needed food. And so at, at Fort Cana, Angus would buy dried buffalo meat, they'd buy buffalo fat, they'd buy buffalo tallow, uh, they'd buy pemmican, you'd take the, grind up the 
buffalo meat mixed with dried berries and, and make, put fat in it and make pemmican. They made things for the horses, the saddle blankets, gun, the halters and the cinches and that. They made the, the Indian suitcase we call the tar flesh that folds over uh, on four sides and you tie it. They, they sold those, they, they dressed the skins. They took the uh, raw hide and they braided it into cords. Uh, Uncle Penny, as I was telling you about, was an expert at that. They take raw hide and braid it into raw hide ropes. And uh, they were about Ram's Alaria rope and very, very strong. They would also take horse hair and horse buffalo hair and, and braid hair ropes also. So they would buy those because they'd need those for their pack, pack strings to do the, to do the packing. And then the uh, unique part of the trade was that when they'd come in with a buffalo hide, the Indian would come in with, uh, say, six buffalo hides. And the Angus, you know, could look at them and give a general value of, say, $30. And, uh, you know, six, that'd be $180. And then they trade for $180 worth of goods, but they didn't do it that way. They wanted to do one hide at a time. So they'd take the one hide and you'd evaluate it, tell them what you could give them for it, and then they would take the trade items that they wanted for it, and then they'd go to hide number two, hide number three, hide number four, and they did it. The, the, the trade went that way. He was apparently a very fair trader because he was so well liked by everybody. When uh, Thomas Adams was working for the uh, the survey of the uh, lands where they're going to put the railroad through, and uh, he came to uh, to the port in 1854, and uh, he reported that uh, that the trade was considerable, and the skins acquired were beaver, otter, marten, fisher, red and cross fox, winter weasel, a vermin, bear, wolf, dress skins of deer, sheep, moose, and buffalo. So all those different knives were, were purchased. And these, these, these items uh, had to be folded and packed in these packs. They had these presses there, you know, one board on top, put the height in, and they had a big long pole, and they press it down so they could get it, squeeze it down as much as they could so they could get a nice, tidy pack of, of about 90 pounds that they could, they could put, on, put on the horse. So what did the Indians want? Well, they wanted the most popular were uh, blankets. The wool blankets was really popular. They sold for about $12. Uh, they wanted knives, powder, guns, the balls for the, for the guns. Uh, they wanted beads, the awls that you make the hole in the leather with, uh, cloth, fish hooks. They wanted utensils and plates and cutlery, cups, for the things that they wanted. Those are things that they could haul. Because these, the English would bring these items you know, up the Pacific coast, and then they'd have to be brought by pack horse back to Fort Con. So you couldn't have two large items, but you could have you know, a lot of these items. And it's amazing, too, that these packers, what they can put on a horse is just amazing. They can, they can pack. So that kind of uh, winds up our presentation. I'd like to be open to questions. And why are you saying Okay, why? I was just going to say I'd like to thank Joe for his leadership, uh, Dr. Bill McDonald. Um, he uh, has done a great job in putting the college together and uh, was president in I don't know how many years, uh, 25, 30 years, just retired about five years ago. Uh, you would know, maybe not think of it or know it by looking at him. He was an uh, all-star athlete all year round. Baseball, basketball, football. I believe he was in the initial uh, uh, Hall of Fame, Indian Hall of Fame. Uh, he's in the Western Montana College Hall of Fame. Uh, he was an uh, outstanding, uh, uh, he was a quarterback in the only championship our hometown ever had as a sophomore, 15 year old sophomore, I think, in high school. Uh, he was a catcher um, in baseball and uh, basketball. He was a run and gun guy. Uh, it was fun to watch him. But uh, anyway, I'd like to thank him. And I'd like to have you all. He very, very rarely ever speaks for himself, but yet I think it's, it's very deserving. Thank you.
You said, I think you said that the uh, boats came from the west, the British boats up the river. Yeah. Uh, how did they get there? Uh, they came all the way around the Cape Horn. Yeah. Okay, yeah. they all actually the did that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, they came okay. up. There's a, uh, and they, they, they were doing that early. You know, we're talking about 1847, but uh, I think that they were actually coming up the coast, you know, in the 1600s because they're, they're uh, Tribes, there's some tribes on the west coast. Uh, in fact, we just visited a couple weeks ago, a uh, Nina Bay tribe where uh, their village was covered by a mudslide and they excavated and they found these metal fish hooks and different utensils. And maybe you know about it. Uh, Ozette. Ozette, yeah. Ozette village. Yeah. And they go back into the 1600s up there. Yeah. Yes. Do you have. A gentleman named Glencoe is the last of uh, MacDonald, who is of Glencoe, of the line that came in there and settled. He was living today with y'all? Yeah. We're, we're Glencoe McDonald's. Okay, but it, are, you, are you from the, are you straight line from the, the one who came in? Yeah. Are yeah. we straight yeah. line from yeah. so, Are we a straight line? Yeah. Yes. yes. The yeah, chief ship of Glencoe is. Empty. It's been empty for several years. <laughs> <laughs> Said the chief chief of ship for that has been empty for years. <laughs> it has. Right, <laughs> <laughs> there, there is an Australian family that is a slave of it, but they're a long way from doing it, and they hired a shyster lawyer in the, in the court in the court of Lord Lyon in Scotland, and all he does is take their money. And uh, he, they're getting very, very perturbed on the property when they get out of the race. And I'm serious, if y'all have something, yeah. we'll talk about it. Uh, one thing about the uh, village, I guess you would call it, is that, uh, I don't know if you've heard or read Jim Hunter's book, Glenn Cole and the Indians. Anyway, he, he traces it from uh, Angus to like, his grandfather, great grandfather, who was. As I said earlier, one of the descent, one of the survivors at Glencoe. Okay. Um, the, the last known one named Glencoe was uh, Dr. Ewan Alpha Duco, who was the 17th of Glencoe. He died in 1840. Hmm. Thank you. Last, we'll talk more. Last survivor. Yeah. Uh, can she leave the boat there? Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, the buses are, you know, we're getting ready to go, so we're going to have to wrap this up. Um,